Welcome to the Artist Advisory Hotline, the podcast for artists who want valuable guidance and honest answers on how to grow their careers and develop their new project from leading art world experts and artists. Here's your host and founder of the Artist Advisory, Marina Press Granger. Tune in as she gets you the answers you deserve. Hello, artists. I'm your host, Marina Granger. And I just want to thank you all so much for listening to this podcast. I'm so, so grateful. I am so grateful to you, Karina, for I just saw that you've reposted a or you replied to a thread with a mention on my podcast episode on rejection. So thank you so much. I'm so grateful to Helena from Germany who is listening to this podcast. She occasionally posts in her stories and shares it uh, with her uh, followers that she listens to this podcast. And I'm just so, so grateful to all of you who listen. Thank you so much. I wanted to share a... Oh, first, I have to give a shout out to my friend, Sarah Moran, who has a beautiful solo exhibition up this month at My Pet Ram on the Lower East Side. Uh, Check it out. Her name is Sarah Moran, and uh, the exhibition is up at the gallery My Pet Ram. It's just stunning and beautiful, and I have never seen anything like it. So big shout out to you. And it was so great seeing uh, my friend, Alana, there, who was like, hey, you know, I listen to all your podcast episodes. So, Alana, thank you so much for listening. Shout out to you. And yeah, you guys wore my heart so much. Uh, So thank you. Thank you. I do have to say, like, I just recorded, this is like the 15th time I'm recording this intro because like either something happens or I forgot what to say, or like last time, uh, I completely forgot to turn my mic on. (laughs) So I was like talking to nothing, but I got to say, like when I am recording these intros, it's so much fun to just talk, but it's really difficult because there's no one on the other end. So I kind of visualize that I'm like getting this message ready for you and I'm radiating it to you guys. Like it's almost like I'm sending Reiki to you, (laughs) like this energy of a message. So uh, that really helps me record. You know, I was listening to a podcast that I really like called uh, Don't Keep Your Day Job. It's the hostess, Kathy Heller. And on the podcast today, she mentioned how the topic, or maybe it's not today, but this week or the most recent episode was on worthiness. It was an interview with Jamie Kern Lima, who has a book called Worthy that I've been listening to, an audio book. And it's really good because a lot of time we don't, you know, sometimes we have the confidence, but we don't feel worthy enough to actually do the thing. And some, I can't tell you how many times (laughs) that has happened to me where I don't even feel worthy, like asking someone to be in my podcast or whatever it is. Um, (laughs) I'm like being really transparent with you guys now. It's an emotional time, you know. Anyway, so I, it really resonated with me, her interview on that, on Kathy Heller's podcast. And I just want to give them both a shout out. And I want to suggest to you to look into this book called Worthy. It is on audiobook, after all, my favorite way to listen to books (laughs) uh, or to read books. Uh, I just like an, I like to hear information. It just like sits better for me. And if you guys are into like astrology and stuff, there's a modality called human design, which is basically a lot of different metaphysical modalities all in one. And it teaches you how you best digest food and information and manifest and all of these wonderful things about your personality, but it's based on when you were born. And when I looked up my uh, human design, and I'm sure you guys have heard of it, it's like, oh, are you a manifesting generator or projector or whatever? 
I'm interested in that, but that's not the most important thing I'm interested in. I'm interested in how I digest information. And I looked it up on, and usually you guys know, right? Like you're like, hey, I'm better. I'm like visual or I like to listen or whatever it is. But the way that I digest information best is through high sound. So through listening. And it's just one of those things that like, I love to listen to audiobooks. I love to listen to podcasts. And maybe you're like me, and that's why you listen to this podcast. So I was listening to Kathy Heller's podcast, and she, they were talking about worthiness. And Kathy Heller said that she knew this rabbi who, like, was she like lived with him and his family he took her in she learned a lot from him but he said one thing to her about worthiness that absolutely blew her mind and it blew my mind when she said it so i'm just going to spread this message around <laughs> and so this rabbi said to her you know if god had a fridge your picture would be on it <laughs> I mean, imagine that, right? Like, what a great way to understand worthiness. First of all, like, thinking about God, source, the universe, whatever your life force giver is, having a refrigerator. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of absurd, but <laughs> hilarious. I feel like that's something that would be on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or in that book, right? Like, this all powerful being or whoever, or the universe itself has a refrigerator. Anyway, and your picture is on it. And that like, doesn't that feel amazing? It really makes you realize that whatever gave you life wants you to have anything that you desire. It's just your birthright, right? To have anything that you desire, to feel worthy. And I've heard analogies for worthiness before, like, oh, well, like a butterfly doesn't question its worthiness of the nectar that it's drinking from this flower. <laughs> but it's it's really one of those things that it's really hard sometimes to understand your worthiness. And so I just want to remind you all about how exactly how worthy you are. So anyway, speaking of worthiness, let's talk about our interview today. So our interview today is with Yana Balenson. She's an incredible artist who I have been working with on and off for probably five years. Actually, when I was preparing for this episode, I was like, wait a minute. I feel like we've worked forever together. I need to go through my emails so I can find our anniversary <laughs> so we can celebrate it. Um, but we end up celebrating around our birthdays pretty much every year because her birthday is November 27th. Mine is December 3rd. It's less than a week apart. And we like to have a little toast. And so it's really wonderful to celebrate her in this interview today. I'm so excited to have her share a little bit about her work and what she does. Now, when I first came to work with her, I was so impressed with how focused she was. <laughs> I came over her house and her studio was like on the top floor of the house where she lived. And it took us like forever to get up there because she had a million and one things going on downstairs. She had two young sons that she was coordinating everything under the sun for. She was taking care of the house. So every now and then, like there would be a delivery or a repair person coming or something like that. And it was just pure, um, there was like disruptions all the time. But her focus was incredible. And I'm even like, <laughs> look, my dog barks when the doorbell rings and I lose my focus, but not so much anymore because it's so interesting to 
practice mindfulness, right? And so that is something that Yana does in her practice and it helps her create her work and it helps her students that she works with as well. So not only is she an artist, she's a mentor and an educator. And this is super special because when I first came to work with her, she had a stutter and it was so intense and I knew she had something to teach. I feel like she really wanted to teach, but we always joke about how I like pushed her to teach while she was kicking and screaming saying, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but now it's so incredible because she's worked with dozens of students. She's helped so many people in her programs. And she also recently created an online course that's it's totally self-paced with beautiful visuals called Painting with Confidence. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the course and how you can paint with confidence and how you can focus, right? How you can focus no matter what. So uh, let's dive into this interview Yana is just incredible. I also have to say she's had like solo shows. She's made so many sales, including a huge sale to um, a hospital where her work is hanging in, pu in public view for permanently, right? And she is just so, so incredible. So let's dive into this interview. Hello, Yana. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's so good to see you in your studio because last time I saw you at the spa, we had a wonderful spa day. We did. Yes. Thank you. And good to see you too. Um, so we have to reveal to everyone that our birthdays are very close together. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, we are uh, Sagittarius. We're Sagittarius. Sagittarii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, we be we began a wonderful tradition of celebrating together. Yeah. So actually, the when we're recording this, Yana's birthday is going to be tomorrow, and my birthday is going to be in like five days. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's pretty crazy. So Yana, happy almost birthday. Same to you. So exciting. Um, yeah, so we've had this tradition of celebrating our birthdays together. I feel like, Yana, you totally started because you were like, hey, we have to celebrate. I have to tell you, I'm like terrible at celebrating my birthday. And I'm so grateful to you for being like, hey, you've got to celebrate this. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I feel like we have to we have to celebrate all the good things in life, and our birthday is certainly one of the good things. And um, for everybody who is listening, Marina Grange is certainly a person to to celebrate every day, not just on your birthday. Ah, thank you. So, Yana, I want to uh, get our listeners to know you a little bit more, you know, beyond your birthday and our spa preferences, um, <laughs> because, yeah, we did that. That was fun. Um, but I wanted to ask you how you got into becoming a painter, becoming an artist. How, tell me about your journey. Well, I wonder if I should do like a long version or a short version. So um, I'll just start with a short version. I'll see how 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 it goes. So I um, started as a child, and I feel it just sounds almost like a cliche, but I always really, you know, as a child, I always painted than drawn. Probably. I used to draw more just because paints were not easily available in the former Soviet Union. And um, I started uh, a very serious school for children when I was 10, where I stayed for six years. So I had like a very uh, rigorous education when I was young. Fast forward many years later, I stopped painting. I uh, emigrated to, uh, to the US. I was an immigrant. I um, we didn't have any money. It had to be a practical endeavor. So I essentially didn't, I didn't paint for years. But then after I um, got my degree in business and I was working, but I always wanted to paint. So I just 
kept taking classes. And I always make this joke that I took full advantage of living in New York City because I took classes, evening classes at absolutely, um, like if your name was school, I was there. And uh, eventually I started uh, taking classes with artists, which I didn't know before that you could do it, but eventually I figured it out. And I'm very thankful to wonderful people with whom I studied over extended periods of time. Uh, Alyssa Monks, uh, she used to teach in her studio in Brooklyn, and uh, Michelle Dahl in Hoboken. Um, I studied with both of them, especially with Michelle for a long time. And then um, I studied in the New York Academy of Art, but all of this was not, um, not degree programs that just took I just, I just was trying to teach myself as much as possible and always feeling I'm falling short of the idea of being a master. So it's for a long time I had this feeling that I just want to do it and um, I'm just falling incredibly short of it and I probably will never reach it, whatever it was. You know, being an expert or being good at it. And I just really did it just because some, I don't remember which author said that, I, I can't remember now, I'll try to remember later, but the pain of not doing it was stronger than the pain of doing it. So that I think I, should, I was just trying to alleviate the pain of not painting. And that was really my only objective. Like I didn't have any, uh, you know, practical objectives like, you know, selling my work or showing my work. I just wanted to get it out of my system and to help myself. It was like medicine for me. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like such a great motivator. It's like when you're on the fence about doing something, like really think to yourself, well, wait, what's going to be more painful, <laughs> not doing it or doing it, right? Yes. Exactly. So it, it really felt like a dose of uh, medication, like an, anti, yeah. an antidepressant. Wow. I have to take that philosophy with me to the gym. <laughs> um, but you take it with you to your studio. And so uh, just to give our listeners kind of like this uh, overview of the time span of, of all of this, you came to this country, you were already an adult, right? So you left all of your friends, your whole life behind in the former Soviet Union. And when you started to take these classes in the evenings, you I hear, you know, you took them in Alyssa Monk's studio in Brooklyn and Michelle Dahl's studio in Hoboken. But before even that, where would you, where, how did you even find these artists? How did you happen about it? Do you remember? I remember, I can actually kind of remember the whole trail of how I found Alyssa. So, um, so as I said before, I just, I was like a blind puppy. Like I was just trying to, you know, I know that an art school is a good place to learn how to paint. So um, you know, Parsons, Pratt, SVA. So um, I just, whenever I, I heard that it was an evening class that I could afford and it worked with my schedule, I, I, I would just take it. So I, I was completely like, really like a blind puppy, just kind of, and honestly, some classes just didn't really work for me. And I feel like this is how it goes. So sometimes um, you have certain idea of what you will take away from it and sometimes it just wasn't what I expected um anyway so I uh to to trace the the, the um my finding Alyssa so I really admire Lee Price and um I was reading an article about her that was I, I don't even remember how many years like 10 years back and uh I in that article, it was mentioned and she studied with Alyssa Monks and then I Googled her and she lived in Brooklyn, which is not very far from where I was. I, I think I emailed her or I don't remember exactly that part, but essentially I found out that she teaches uh, at her studio um, on Sundays. And it was perfect for me. So 
uh, I um, I called her. I started coming to these classes. I through Alyssa, I found out about the New York Academy of Art because I didn't. That's the one school I didn't know about for some reason. Um, I started taking class with uh, Robert Armata, and that's another person I want to mention here because I started with him since 2017 in a wonderful group. And um, first of all, Robert is just an incredible teacher. And not only he is absolutely wonderful, encouraging, and especially when you're really hard on yourself, he is just... Uh, he is able to encourage you in such a way that gives you, you know, hope. Uh, but on top of that, which I didn't expect from continued education, the fact is that I made very good friends in that group and uh, and really serious painters. Although we were not in a degree program, but really serious and good people that I'm I'm very grateful to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and Michelle Dole is connected to the Academy. So I found, eventually found out about her and uh, and I'm very grateful to, to Michelle. Uh, she's an incredibly generous teacher and just like a wonderful person. Love that. And, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what you are painting now. Like we can all Google you and look at your work, but I want to hear it from you. Tell us what is... What are you working on now? Well, right this second, I'm working on a landscape, which is something that is really not um, not like me at all. And I always said to myself, I'm not a landscape painter, but just feel like never say never. You never know what will come out. Um, so technically, it's a landscape, which... Uh, so we're talking at the very end of November, so I'm guessing I probably started posting about it, or I will post it soon, the painting. It's more of an imaginary landscape, so it's kind of a mixture of um, different views of nature and also different seasons, so it's um, it's almost completely imagined. So it's a, it's a mixture of fall and summer, spring, uh, and the main the main idea and kind of to tie into my other paintings, I feel like the subject is not that important. I mean, it is important, but the most important is something that Vincent Desiderio calls technical narrative. And I feel that term just ever since I, you know, I read uh, and I listened to his lectures and I read this, it just makes total sense to me. So it's not so much like a brand that I want to create or um, a certain um, subject. I really don't care about it that much, but as long as my painting process remains the same and um, consistent and my stroke application remains consistent, then my subjects can really vary. And my work ranges from still lifes, which are kind of like almost like a classic still life, or something that takes the idea of 17th century Dutch uh, paintings and just extrapolates it. And I'm just, I just piece it apart and just try to see what you can do with it. Uh, the other paintings, which are in the work, you know, for a long time, but they, um, uh, combinations of female figure in a, this Im imagined kind of scenario like landscapes and florals and just paints of pure color and of course a lot of flowers so flowers and fl flowers in color if I were to name a subject I would say this is probably something that always comes up mm -hmm. um, but again like to I feel like really strongly that the technical narrative is really the core of what I do and everything else mm. is sort of on the periphery of that. Mm. Now, when it comes to everything else that's on the periphery of that, one thing that I know because I've known you for so long and I've watched you develop your work, I want to ask you about a few things that really influence your uh, technical narrative, right? And I'm just going to name some things because I just want to get to the bottom of it. But 
mindfulness is a big part of it, right? Yes. Uh, and so that's something that we almost don't think of right away when we think of technical narrative, because when we think of technical narrative, we think of something that is super pragmatic and technical and practical and in a way is very much uh, what we call masculine energy, right? But there's so much feminine energy in your work Uh when it comes to, and when I say masculine feminine energy, I'm talking about like the feminine divine and the masculine divine and all of these kind of um, sort of like philosophical ways to look at it. Uh, but when we look at what's supporting this technical narrative for you, it is mindfulness. It is spirituality, right? Yes. So can yes. you tell me a little bit about how that plays a role in your work and how you get there? Well, I'll I'll try to do my best. I feel like uh, there is no single recipe or one size fits all. I can just say what works for me. So I uh, started doing uh, essentially daily meditation a while ago. And it was very difficult to make it daily. So I feel like I found out just about the idea of a meditation maybe 15 years ago through uh, Wayne Dyer. Somebody's a fan. Um, and his books were the first self-help books that I read. And um, his meditations were the first ones I tried. And this idea of that you can manifest anything you set your mind to manifest it just really at first just was something completely unbelievable to me but I kept you know listening to Wayne and um I felt like I had this period of in my life when I was just incredibly depressed and I felt that Wayne died just pulled me out of uh, my depression slowly and I listened to him on like just, just continuously so I remember it was um I used to buy his books uh as cds and they were always in my car and just when the book was so there was like six or eight cds and when the last one was over I just put the first one back in and I felt like that was helping me tremendously so Wayne Dyer I know you know he's in heaven now and just to say how grateful I am for you and it coincided Maybe, you know, not because I don't believe in coincidences, but it kind of, my discovery of Wayne Dyer and meditation coincided with the fact that I decided to, to rent a space in a warehouse in Hoboken and um, just try to paint. And I didn't know that much technically. I kind of relied on what I learned as a child, plus all of these evening courses that I took. That was before, you know, before Alyssa and Michelle and more like serious exploration and I spent a year in that place which was like almost like self-punishment because it was such a rough space like there was no heat no air conditioning and um it was like really very rough and um in the bathroom I can't, I can't even describe it it's, it's beyond description uh but uh but I you know, I was painting, I produced only two paintings that year. It was a lot of like self-discovery and listening to Wayne Dyer. So I don't know if it's too long, but you know, uh, I started to meditate and with time, I just realized how important this is. And it's just a wonderful method uh, to have. And uh, more than method, it's really like a way of being and meditation became the um like the high point of my day my touchstone that's this is where I get my strength from so yeah so and eventually so many years later it became my daily practice and uh mindfulness just goes hand in hand with that because you just can't rush when you do it and my especially with my particular method of painting which is a very slow method and it's almost impossible to rush it or 
if I if I were to try to rush it, I would just ruin the process. And for me, the process is a very mindful process. It's like it's um, it's something that just cannot be rushed. It's impossible to do it quickly. You really have to think about it. And um, I don't know if we probably don't have time to describe my process, which is impossible anyway, because it's, you know, it's easier maybe to see it or, you know, I, t I teach, I teach it, or I teach my philosophy of that. But essentially, I just take such a long time to prepare. And, um, you know, I, um, I prepare my brushes, I premix my paint, it takes me sometimes two hours just to to prepare. So the process takes a long time. And every stroke is almost literally one stroke at a time. Um, I try to show it in my videos on um, Instagram, but I'm not sure how um, how well it shows the process. Um, but yeah, so I feel like a mindfulness started to kind of leak into my everyday life. Mm -hmm. So just this thinking that it can be this elegance and grace about just whatever we do like when we make you know when we cook our food or when we make a bed or when we do our laundry and sometimes things which we don't really want to do and we kind of want to rush through them but it's still a part of life and you you kind of give yourself a disservice if you rush through it even if it's folding laundry which is probably like one of my least favorite things to do that's so funny. It's literally one of my favorite things to do is to fold laundry. <laughs> it like it calms me down so much. But you know, I I just want to interject here and ask you, or you know, or maybe just tell our listeners who might not know exactly what mindfulness is. You know, they might have heard this term somewhere, but they don't know what it is. So do you want to tell them what mindfulness is? Well, I can uh, I can just describe my view of this, which yeah. might be the definition. I feel like for me, this is when you really think about any any action that you that you do, any, but not just not just action, but even every word that you say and every thoughts so this is like at another level like even every thought that comes into your head because we can control it as well so our thoughts sometimes it's just kind of this like unruly children like you know playing and this is a chaos and thank god that we can edit it enough when we speak but i feel like it's uh almost like a hygiene like that with you know now that we know enough to you know to brush our teeth and to wash our bodies and that this is emotional hygiene like when yeah. we clean our our emotions and we, when we wash them you know with soap and uh you know iron them and just make sure that they're as clean as our outside which is probably more more important so this idea of the emotional hygiene is something that i'm not always very successful at it honestly but i i'm working on it and things like I wanted to just say, this is so beautiful that you call it like emotional hygiene to be mindful, but I just want to read the exact definition, which makes so much sense. Like everything is clicking so much for me, even though I've known you for so long, I'm like, why didn't it click earlier? But you know, sometimes it happens a little later. So, uh, Mindfulness is a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment, right? Yes, that's perfect. It's that so, perfect. so important because, you know, you were saying that painting got you out of this really depressed state, right? Yes. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have all heard of this, that you know, depression is when you're thinking about the past, right? And anxiety is when you're thinking about the future. Yes. So being in that mindfulness zone is calming down those voices and just living in the present moment, which is so important when you're painting. 
because then you can really focus on your work. You can really focus on your paintings. Now, Yana, you have, uh, I totally, I should have asked you if it was okay to mention on this podcast, but I'm just going to roll with it. Well, you have a PDF that's available for download called Painting with Confidence, like four yes. steps to painting with confidence. And I want to tie this all together for everyone because, you know, mindfulness is when you're in that state, you are not burdened by anything other than what you're doing. And so you really get into the zone of confidence. And I wanted to ask you if you could give us one of the tips from this PDF, right? And it's a free PDF. You guys can download it from Yana's website and I can put the link in the show notes. But yeah, if you could just tell us one thing that's going to get us there. What's sure. the first step? Well, um, first... Hmm. I mean, I feel like this is this is what I teach privately, and there is several kind of aspects of this. And I already mentioned meditation, which is important. But um, let me give you this visual, and just let me know if it makes sense. And I I put it in this PDF, but I didn't want to make it too long, so I hope this will expand this idea of lighting a fire and keeping it alive. And at the very least, keeping it alive during the course of a painting. So we have limited amount of energy in us, right? So this is why we need to sustain ourselves with things like sleep, food, and then talking to people that inspire us or listening to something that inspires us, reading, and just moments of, of calm, and then our energy level will go up. So when we begin a painting, especially especially if it's a big painting, you need to have more energy in you because it's like you light a fire and you have to sustain it. And the visual that I give my students is, imagine that you have a candle and you're walking through a forest and your job is not so much everything else that's in the darkness and this things that you imagine are real, you know, scary things, but you just focus on the flame and just focus on keeping the flame alive. And if you can, you can walk through the whole forest while keeping this flame alive, this is the objective. So I hope it makes sense with the idea of a painting because as we paint, and especially if it's a bigger painting, and we always have this, you know, we begin with enthusiasm and we have our references, so we have our setup. And then almost um, for sure, you will come to a point of an ugly stage in your painting. And if it's a bigger painting, it will happen more than once. And oftentimes you feel that it's just, it's just so bad and it's, almost like impossible to fix it like what what do you do with it it's such a you know you put so much energy into it and it's really it just it's not working it's just not working whatever you do and sometimes the more you try and the more you keep at it it's because the painting has a mind of its own and sometimes it's not so easy to decipher it it doesn't want to be an easy riddle it wants to be solved with some Okay, again, mindfulness and put just putting some time and taking yourself to a new level. So if you burn out at this point, you're not going to have energy to finish it. So I hope this visual makes sense. So even at that moment, which is a difficult moment, and it can it can come up many times, and finding solutions, not focusing on the problem that you have, but finding solutions, whatever the solutions are. It can be step, stepping away from your painting. It could be turning it upside down. It could be literally not touching it for a year and then dealing with it. Maybe asking a friend, you know, maybe scrubbing it, um, taking a knife to it, which I have done many, many times. I have so many tools which I use to scrub or destroy a painting, including an electric sander. You know, whatever your tools are. But the important thing that you cannot lose that is that that flame 
So whatever is happening with the painting, you can just tell yourself, I'm just experimenting, that's okay. Whatever, even if it gets destroyed, who cares? It's, you know, nobody's life is in danger. But focusing on that flame and keeping it alive through the whole process. I feel like this is the most important thing. I, and I hope it makes sense with the confidence thing. So if your fire is still burning, then you're still okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's so good. You know, it's so funny. I never, I knew this theoretically, but hearing you say this is blowing my mind that there's an ugly stage in your paintings. I, you know, I'm not an artist, right? Like, so, and I've seen work in progress and I'm always like, well, it's going to get there. It's going to get there. You know, I've got, done studio visits, you know, and things like that. And so it's so uh, refreshing to hear you acknowledge it and be like, hey, it's okay. It's just part of the process. This does happen and you can't beat yourself up about it because it's almost like just accept it and yeah. then deal with it in, in whatever way that makes sense for you. So that's so beautiful. And um, yeah, it's the beautiful side to this ugly side, right? Now, I wanted to ask you one more question uh, to kind of uh, go back to what you were saying about how really the way that you're painting is in a similar way to manifesting, right? And so again, I just want to underline that, you know, not everybody will know what manifestation is, but a lot of my listeners will. But the idea behind manifestation is that your thoughts affect your beliefs, which affect your actions, which affect your result. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So it all starts from your thought. And being in that present moment with your artwork is so important mm -hmm. because in that way you can manifest this result of what you want in an artwork, right? Whatever it is your goal is to, to get there. But Yana, I wanted to ask you this when it comes to manifestation, because you were raised in the Soviet Union. And yes. oh, what is, did manifestation exist there? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I can't imagine because I, I lived in the Soviet Union until I was seven. And I don't think I got that deep in my uh, development there, but you probably did. So tell me, you know, tell me about that. Uh, well, I can just say that although I heard that psychology existed, like, you know, I heard that word, but I didn't see any practical applications of that and things like, you know, therapy or any, really anything that I'm using now on a daily basis, I didn't know existed. And I had to learn all of this uh, completely. So it took me a long time to learn it. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, like, I feel like, but speaking about the ugly side, so I feel like, okay, so there is no light without darkness. And I feel like having, you know, having arrived to this country, which is, I'm just incredibly grateful that I'm here now and I'm raising my family in this country. I feel like having seen how it can be, it just makes you so incredibly grateful just for many things that we have here. Uh, and even the, well, one of them, the important one being the, you know, just the availability of all of these modalities and you can learn anything if you want. It's all, it all exists. So it's not just limited to when you're a student in college. Like now it's, it's incredible because if you want to learn, you don't have to go to the library when you can, it's all online, it's all available. It's even maybe a little bit too much and it's, it's difficult to choose what you want to listen to. But you can completely create your self-education out of just things that are around. And uh, I feel this is, it just behooves us, like every you know thinking being that has access to this just behooves us to, to learn it and to continue developing. It always, it's like one of my you know pet peeves is people who, think they're an expert in some field and they completely stop their 
you know, development. So they don't listen to, to I don't know, interesting podcasts or books and uh, like like this one. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Yana, that is so beautiful and it takes us full circle because it brings me back to this vision of you where you were like, hey, you know, I want to learn about art and you went out there and you curated classes for yourself to take, right? This is such a beautiful thing that we can do here. This is, it's amazing that we have this education available, these podcasts, these books, these classes. And I know, you know, when we first met, I told you, I was like, I always work with a coach. <laughs> I was like, I usually have like two or three at a time because I need to keep growing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we really bonded on that. And yes. I love that now you are also mentoring artists. So tell me a little bit about your experience with that. And, you know, what is so, what's the most fun thing for you about mentoring artists well I feel like I have to kind of go back to the idea that my education beyond my bachelor's degree which was in business and I I don't have I don't have formal education and um everything that I've learned as you said it just bits and pieces it's going to this college it's taking this class it's studying with this person listening and reading a lot. I I read every single day, uh, at least an hour. Um, so it's completely self-created, which means um, like my goal was never to teach uh, or like to teach at the college level. Um, that's why I somewhat regret not having a master's degree, but then I feel like it's just, I um, it doesn't make any sense for me. So just to explain that teaching was never my objective and I kind of fell into it. Well, I can just say that because of Marina, because she uh, really made me do it <laughs> at some point. And um, I started teaching online on Zoom during COVID and it started more like as a, more the technical help to artists and um slowly I started to develop my methodology and the more I was listening and reading like various spiritual literature the more I tied various modalities into my teaching so at this point it's just a really different methodology where probably 50 percent of it is it's a, I would say it's a serious boost to an artist self-esteem and their way of being an artist so um and it goes to their just feeling about it just feeling confident with that feeling confident that they're on the right path and exploring different modalities within that path which without even going to technical even which we, which we do it at every, at every at every class but i feel like for me uh, I have this theory that there, there's a pyramid of like it's like a, a Maslow pyramid of values. So the pyramid is um, technical is at the bottom, conceptual is in the center, and emotional is at the top. And I prefer to work with people um, on these three levels at the same time, if it makes sense. So we work on the technical every every week. We work on the concept absolutely. And we work on the emotional. And I feel like from that point, so I don't have a method that fits everyone. It's completely bespoke and it's whatever I feel about the, what this person needs. And it just becomes a really, you know, I would say it's, it's coaching. And very often we become friends because it's one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Uh, I just can't help it. It just, we we start bonding and I'm really vested. I have to say that I'm honestly just vested in the success of my students. And I feel this is something that's a part of their success because I honestly wish to manifest their success as well. 
So I hope it makes sense. And uh, I don't know, like, I feel like everybody has their own teaching style and it could be something more reserved or so this is, you know, this is essentially it. This is the method. You can take it or leave it or you can take whatever you want from it, which is, which is fine. Uh, but I feel I, I honestly and truly wish and manifest the success of my students and they eventually become just it blows my mind sometimes to see what my students can achieve and I'm just infinitely happy for them yeah oh I love that well uh I want to say ditto <laughs> and uh, just watching you is making me so honored and grateful to have worked with you too you know because I'm seeing like you said I well you know to our listeners Yana and I have worked together one-on-one -on -one, and yes. she came to me for uh, guidance with her art career and I saw this in her that she was an incredible speaker she was an incredible educator and like she said, I uh, pushed her uh, kicking and screaming, quote unquote, yes. <laughs> um, into public speaking and teaching. And it is it has been so amazing to watch you thrive in this and also to see your work develop. I mean, it's really amazing. And I don't know if, for some of you, if you might see the background on this, uh, the video portion of this, it's so beautiful to see you these three paintings behind you right now because of this uh, round one behind you, the oval, is an early, early painting. Right? Yes. This is from like 2018. And then the big one uh, on the side there is just so, I, I feel like every time I see it, it becomes a new painting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's because you're always working on it, but it's just so powerful and so stunning. And then this new little one behind you, I'm obsessed with those. And they are, as you mentioned earlier, uh, this um, ode to Dutch still life paintings yes. uh, that were made by women. Yeah. Right? Uh, that we don't hear about, right? We hear about all these other Dutch pe Dutch painters from the 17th and 18th century. We don't know uh, that women were very much painting at the time so this is so great to see and oh it has been amazing to have you here I want to ask you uh if you could tell our listeners how they can find you what's your Instagram what's your website how do they download your pdf I'll put that in the show notes but just in case they're on the go and listening let us know sure and well thank you first of all for uh, having me on this podcast and I know that you know Marina doesn't need um, introduction on this podcast but I'm just I just wanted to say that how grateful I am that to Matthew and to become your friend likewise so. oh yeah no. okay anyway all right so my uh my uh website is my name Yana Balinson artist.com uh, and the link to get a free pdf it's really visible on my website so it's at the top navigation of my website and my instagram is just my name no spaces so it's yana balenson um and this is it beautiful yana thank you so so much and Happy almost birthday to both of us. Both yeah. of us. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you. And yes. I'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. Support your community by sharing this podcast, leaving a review, and follow The Artist Advisory on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore advisory. And visit us online at www.theartistadvisory.com.